So here's a working model simulation of a classic problem that one studies in control theory. That is this, this rectangular mass down here is attached and is constrained to move along a straight line just back and forth. There's no friction whatsoever encumbering its motion. And then you have the pendulum, this, this circular mass here that's, that's attached to the other mass through a rigid rod. The pendulum sort of swings back and forth as the, as the rectangular mass responds to it. It's kind of cool looking, yeah? So the traditional control problem is how do you apply a force to this rectangular mask? How do you push it left or right in such a way that you can keep the pendulum balanced upright? That is, keep the pendulum up here, up at the top, without falling over. Now that is the control problem, and we will study that in this class. But you know, before we get there, before we start applying control theory, what we need to do is derive equations of motion for the system. And that's really the purpose of this video. So here's my little cartoon drawing of the system. We've got this mass of the cart. I'll call that mass MC. The mass of the pendulum bob, I'll call that MP. We'll let L represent the length of that pendulum. So those are the parameters that characterize the system. And then we need dynamic variables, state variables, to describe its motion. And for that, we'll let the position of the cart be x. And to represent the angle at which the pendulum is leaning from vertical, we'll use the symbol theta. And theta positive is the direction indicated here. So if theta dot is positive, this thing would be rotating counterclockwise as we're viewing it. Ooh, that picture's getting pretty busy. Just a couple more things I want to add to it. I want to put in the standard basis vector. So I'll call i hat horizontal, j hat vertical like so. So now we're ready to start deriving equations of motion. And there's more than one way to do this. Perhaps the most elegant way to derive these equations is with the formulation called the, the Lagrange approach or Lagrange formulation. As I said, that's the most elegant way to do it. But it also, in order to understand what's going on there, you need to, you need to do a bit of work, right, to understand the derivation of how, how, how Lagrange approach works. We're not going to do that. We're going to do the simplest approach that's not the cleanest, not the most elegant, but perhaps simplest. You only need sort of sophomore level engineering dynamics to do it. So that's, that's, way, that's the way we're going to go. We're just going to go straightforward, Newton's second law, F equals MA, and see where that takes us. So the first thing I'm going to do is draw a free body diagram of the cart. And when I say draw a free body di diagram of the cart, I mean just the cart, not the pendulum. So what are the forces acting on the cart? Maybe you should do this yourself and pause the video. Make sure you get all the forces yourself. But here I go. First thing I'm putting on here is the weight of the cart itself. So this is a MC times G in the minus J hat direction. And the next thing we have is a normal force pushing upward. This is the force of the road or the track or whatever pushing up on the cart. So this is an N in the J hat direction. And then there's the tension or compression in this massless rod right here. So I'm going I'm to call tension positive. So I'll call that force uh, T sine theta in the minus I direction plus T cosine theta in the J, like so. And then I have one more force. It's not really apparent in there. But when I was describing this to you, I was saying that in our control problem, what you do is you imagine pushing the cart to the left or right in order to keep the pendulum balanced. So that control force, that force pushing the cart left and right, I'm just going to call F. It's going to be horizontal, of course. So F in the I hat direction. And then F can be positive or negative. It can be changing in time. It's what the, what's the controller decides is necessary. So now we need the free body diagram of the pendulum itself. That's this circular mass up here. Remember that we're assuming that the rod is massless, so we do not need a free body diagram of the rod anywhere in this thing. So here we are at the pendulum. What are the forces acting on it? The first one that comes to mind is its weight, or at least my mind. It's, it's MPG in the minus J hat direction. So there's the weight of the pendulum acting down on it. And then it also feels the tension in the rod again. It's the exact same rod, so it's the exact same tension, but it's the other end of the rod. So it's a force equal in magnitude, opposite in direction of the tension acting on the cart. So when I draw the rod tension on this free body diagram, I'll put it in exactly the opposite direction. And when I label it, I'll put it T, positive T sine theta in the I hat direction, and then minus T cosine theta in the J hat direction. Remember, they're equal and opposite. So this force right here is equal and opposite to that one up there. And I think that does it. 
So now I think I'm ready to start writing equations of motion. To do that, I'll use Newton's second law. And I'm going to start with the cart. And we'll pick off the i-hat direction, or the horizontal direction first. And when we write this out, we're just going to look at my free body diagram. So in the horizontal direction, I've got a force F. I can push to the left or to the right. I've got a component of the tension, right? Minus T sine theta. And those are all the forces I have horizontally over here. So this has to equal mass times mass of the cart times the acceleration of the cart horizontally. And the acceleration of the cart horizontally is x double dots. So there's my, my first equation. In fact, I'm going to give it the uh, label 0. So that's equation number 0 right there. Now I can also write an equation for, for the dynamics vertically, right? So I got forces vertically. I'll have an acceleration vertically. Ooh, actually the cart does not accelerate vertically at all, right? But I, so I can write equations for, for the vertical motion, but that's not going to be very interesting to me since nothing is moving vertically. It's only moving horizontally. So if I were interested in this normal force, perhaps I'd be interested in writing that equation. But I don't care what that normal force. It's whatever is necessary to keep this thing uh, from accelerating upward or downward. So I'm going to skip the vertical direction for the cart and move directly onto the pendulum. Now for the pendulum in the horizontal direction, the i-hat direction, what do we have? We'll just look at the free body diagram again. I got t sine theta. And by the way, if you didn't follow the, the sines and cosines up here and over there, I encourage you to go through that and look at that and make sure you understand that because that, that trigonometry is important. So I have t sine theta pushing to the in the positive i-hat direction. So that's a positive there for positive t. And that's my only force horizontally. So this is equal to mass of the pendulum times the acceleration or the horizontal component of acceleration of this pendulum. So I'm just going to, for now, I'm just going to call that APX. So that's the acceleration of the pendulum uh, in the horizontal direction, or the horizontal component. All right, so next we'll move over to the vertical direction. Let me scroll upward a little bit. We don't have to see those pictures up ahead. We just look at the pendulum now. So in the j hat direction, minus t cosine theta pulling down. We have the weight pulling down as well, so minus mpg. And this has to equal mass of the pendulum times the acceleration of the pendulum vertical component. All right, so those two equations for my pendulum, horizontal and vertical, I'll give those names too, or labels. I'll call them equation number one and equation number two. Now equations 0, 1, and 2, while these are valid dynamic equations for my system, I'm still a few steps away or several steps away in actually coming up with the equations of motion because look what I have. I've got things in terms of APX and APY. I need tension. I need to write everything in terms of the states. I need to write everything, including these accelerations, in terms of X, X dot, X double dot, theta, theta dot, theta double dot, those things. So I can't just have a symbol here, APX, APY and sit with that. So what I'm going to do next is go back to kinematics. I'm going to try to write these accelerations, APX and APY, in terms of the states, in terms of the X, X double dot, X single dot, and theta, theta dot, theta double dot, and try to write those accelerations that way. So I'm going to use a result that I hope you remember from your dynamics class. That is, we'll say the acceleration of the pendulum is equal to the acceleration of the cart plus the acceleration of the pendulum relative to the cart. And of course, all these are vectors, so let me put a little tilde underneath. Right? Remember this thing? This is our nice little expression for, for relative accelerations. And this approach is really kind of handy when you have bodies connected to each other by things like pin joints, uh, like I have here. All right, so let's go through with this. Here's the acceleration of the pendulum, and, ex and it's expressed in terms of the acceleration of the cart, or relative acceleration of the pendulum relative to the cart. So remember the acceleration of the cart. In fact, we've already written it up here. The acceleration of the cart you know, position of the car is just x, so the acceleration and it just moves along a straight line, so the acceleration of the car is just x double dot. So this AC, that, that part's really easy. It's just an x double dot in the i hat direction. Now the acceleration of the pendulum relative to the cart, that's a little trickier, but actually not too bad. Let me make some space over here to draw a little picture. Now here's the cart and the pendulum again. Now when I say acceleration of the pendulum relative to the cart, that means we're looking at the pendulum from a point of reference that's fixed to the cart, that's moving with the cart. As the cart moves back and forth, a reference or the way we look at the pendulum is also moving with that cart. So the only way that the pendulum moves with respect to the cart is around in a perfect circle. 
this, this rod here connecting the pendulum to the car. It's rigid. It doesn't get any shorter. It doesn't get any longer. So that pendulum always has to be a constant distance from this pin joint right here. Again, it moves along in a perfect circle. So the only way that, that you get acceleration from a perfect circle is from two different sources. One type of acceleration you get by going along a perfectly circular path has the form L theta double dot. Right? This is an acceleration in the e hat, so I'll call it the e hat theta direction, where e hat theta direction is this way over here. It's tangent to the circle, right? So you get this type of acceleration when theta dot is changing. So when the rotation rate is changing, you get actually, and you actually get a theta double dot. That's that type of acceleration. That means you're speeding up or slowing down along the direction of that circular path. So there's one type of acceleration. And then there's another type of acceleration that looks like this. Oops, I should have a minus sign right there. Other time it looks like this. It's an L times a theta dot squared in the minus E hat R direction, where the positive E hat R direction is radially outward. So E hat R. And this is your centripetal acceleration, right? This is an acceleration in the minus e hat r direction. It's acceleration towards the center. It's due to the fact that as this, as this pendulum is going around in a perfect circle around the cart, and that is a relative to the cart, it's going around in a perfect circle, the, di the direction of that velocity is changing, right? That direction is always turning inwards, and I get an acceleration inwards towards the center, hence the word centripetal. So that's my acceleration, right? The acceleration of the pendulum is equal to the acceleration of the cart. That's this piece right here. Plus the acceleration of the pendulum relative to the cart. So that's these pieces right here in the square brackets, right? This is the fact that, that we're moving around in a perfect circle, at least from a frame of reference, moving with the cart. Now, when I write it this way, I'm throwing a little bit of a monkey wrench into the mix because I just wrote these these two pieces of my acceleration in terms of e hat r and e hat theta, whereas I've done everything else in terms of i and j, right? So my equations of motion are in terms of i and j, so I better reconcile this by, by writing these accelerations in terms of the i and the j. So when I write things in terms of i and j, this is what I get. So I get the x double dot, this is still in the i hat direction, forgot that i. And then we have L theta double dot, that's in the E hat theta direction, but E hat theta direction, I can write that in terms of I and J, right? So that'd be a minus cosine theta in the I, minus a sine theta in the J. Recall that theta is this theta that I defined originally up there. So that theta is the same as sort of a theta right there as well. But you could do the trigonometry, you can find that out. And, the, and similarly, the positive E hat R direction would be in the minus, have a minus sine theta in the i hat and a cosine theta, positive cosine theta in the j hat, right? I'll let you work out that trigonometry, make sure it makes sense. So now the next order of business is to, is to solve these expressions for acceleration into my equations of motion, uh, number one and number two over here. So in particular, when I put this into equation number one, I get t sine theta, that's directly from above, equals mass of the pendulum times the horizontal component of the pendulum's acceleration. So I get an mp times an x double dot, just from here. Oop, maybe should be looking right here. And then I'm going to pull off these horizontal pieces, right? This i piece and that i piece. So I've got a minus l theta double dot cosine theta. And I have a plus, minus minus is plus. So plus l theta dot squared sine of theta. So there's my new equation number two, my new equation number one, which I'm going to call an equation number three now. I just realized I made two small, small mistakes. I forgot to put the MP in this term and that term as well. So let me make room for that. So there's MP in both those equations now. So now I think it's okay. I hope. And what I'm going to do next is do the same process on equation number two. I'm going to put the vertical components of acceleration into here. Let me just scroll up to make some room for that and go for it. So equation two has a minus t cosine theta minus the weight equals, and again, I'm just pulling off the vertical pieces now. So I've got a minus mp l theta double dot sine theta. And then down here, I also have a minus mp l theta dot squared cosine theta. And I'm calling this one equation number four. I hope I did that one right. Please check this for yourself as, as I'm writing this. You should be writing this for yourself 
make sure all the steps make sense, make sure you can do the exact same thing. All right, so now let's check where we are. So look, I've got equations number three and number four here, and they are differential equations. In other words, they have x double dot, that will theta double dot, theta dots in here. So it's a relationship between x and theta and their various derivatives. There's a different, that's the definition of a differential equation, which is what we're after, right? Equations of motion are differential equations. And I also have equation number zero up here as well. We haven't used that guy yet, but this is, here's another differential equation in there. So really I have three uh, differential equations right here. Three, number three, number four, and number zero up at the top. And guess what? There are three unknowns. We got the theta and the x. Those are sort of two unknowns and they're various derivatives. But we also have a tension in here as well. Now this tension here in general is okay. We can keep that tension in there. But if we can, we'd like to eliminate it. Right, because it's going to save a bit of a hassle later on. And in this problem, it is actually quite easy to get rid of the tension, so I suggest we do it. So let's go ahead and do that. And here's, here's how I'm going to do it. I've got a little trick up my sleeve. So I'm looking at these two equations right here, number three and number four. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take equation number three and multiply it by cosine of the angle theta and then add to it equation number four multiplied by sine theta. And maybe you can see right now exactly what's going to happen. So when we do this, let's check this out. In fact, we'll just go term by term. So this in equation number three here, I'm gonna take t sine theta, I'm gonna multiply by cosine. In fact, I'm multiplying every single term in here by cosine. But we'll start with this one right here, the t sine theta gets multiplied by cosine, so I get t sine theta cosine theta, right? And then let's look at, before going on, let's, let's look at this term down below. So I got a minus t cosine theta, that's in equation number four. So things in equation number four, I'm gonna multiply by sine theta. So this one's gonna be minus t cosine theta sine theta. What was the one above again? The one above was t sine theta cosine theta. Here's minus t cosine theta cosine theta sine theta. So when I add these two things together, these two pieces are going to cancel each other out in this operation right there. So they're going to go away. In fact, those are the only two terms with the tension in there. So that's how I get rid of the tension. So when I get rid of those two terms, when I get those two terms to cancel each other out, poof, tension's gone. And what I'll have left is the result of this operation, right? I kind of like that. Okay, so on the left-hand side, I've got those two terms that canceled out and got away. And on the left-hand side, I still have this term right here, mpg, but I'm multiplying that one by sine theta. So I'm gonna have minus mpg sine theta coming out of this. That's cool. I like that. So that's all I have left on the left-hand side of these equations once I do this operation on it. Okay, so what do I have on the right-hand side? So on the right-hand side, I have an mpx double dot Right, so mp x double dots, and since that's in equation number three, that gets multiplied by a cosine. And there's no other x double dots, so that, that's gonna survive there. And then the next thing I have is a minus mpl theta double dot cosine theta, and I'm multiplying that by a cosine theta. So this is gonna be mpl theta double dot cosine squared theta, right? And notice the one below it, that also has an mpl theta double dot. And that one I'm multiplying by sine, so this is going to be minus mpl theta double dot sine squared. And when I add these two terms together, I got mpl theta double dot, this one's going to be cosine squared, this one's going to be sine squared, and cosine squared plus sine squared is just one. So when I do these operations with the cosine and the sine, and I add the terms together, these two ther terms combine together in a really nice simple way, I get minus mpl theta theta double dot, and since cosine squared plus sine squared is one, boom, that's all I get out of those two. Simplifies quite nicely. So there's that, and then let's move over to the centripetal pieces, the L theta dot squared pieces. And remember, this one also comes in the same pattern as what we had over here, you'll notice. So this first one, when I multiply by cosine, I got MPL theta dot squared sine theta cosine theta, that comes out of this cosine right there. And the second one gets an MPL theta dot squared cosine theta. I'm multiplying that one by sine theta. Ooh, so I got sine theta cosine theta on the top and I got cosine theta sine theta on the bottom. Again, these ones are gonna cancel each other out. 
so those ones go away and this is all I have left and I like it so much I'm gonna call that equation number five so here's my essentially my pendulum equations remember I had two pendulum equations they started off as as equations number one and number two and then when I substituted those expressions in for the acceleration I got equations number three and four and then what I did is took three and four together combined them in a such a way that got rid of the tension when I got rid of the tension I can just replace these two equations by this one equation right here very very nice so now I have one equation that has it's a differential equation it relates derivatives of x and theta but I've got one equation right here with sort of two we get the, with different derivatives of two different states in there so I need another equation and that other equation ooh, it's equation number zero at the top so here's my other equation here's my second equation but notice that one has a t in it oh man it has a t shoot what am I gonna do but wait don't fear don't fear don't fear because remember down here remember equation number three it says t sine theta equals all this stuff remember how tension appeared in equation number zero t sine theta so I can take this t sine theta right here and make a substitution this t sine theta has got to be the same as that t sine theta. So wherever I see a t sine theta in this expression up here, all I'm going to do, oops, this expression up here, all I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute in all this stuff right there. Well, first of all, we'll note that it's a minus, f minus t sine theta. So we'll say, so we'll say f and we'll have minus t sine theta. So I'm going to get a minus mpx double dot. Now I'm not going to put that term in yet because I want to put it in later on here. So I'll go to the next term, minus t sine theta. So I'm going to get a minus this stuff. So this is going to be plus mp l theta double dot cosine theta out of there, minus mp l theta dot squared sine theta equals, and notice that on the equal sign I have mcx double dot right there, but I forgot to write down the mp x double dot I didn't actually forget I just felt like pushing it all over the other side so when I combine those two terms together I get mp plus mc x double dot and there's my next equation which I call number six so now what I have are two equations there's no tension in here anymore which is very nice so we had two differential equations relating the states x x dot x double dot to the other states theta theta dot theta double dot Wow, so here's my differential equation. These are the equations of motion for my system. And they're nonlinear differential equations. There's a sine theta in there, there's a theta dot squared over there, and a cosine theta here, so highly nonlinear differential equations. But nonetheless, these are the equations of motion for the system. They can be simplified somewhat, and we'll do that. But for now, I would say we're done. We, we hit our goal. We've got equations of motion for the system. We'll end this video right here.